Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. Today, we're unpacking a monumental transformation unfolding in China, a strategic pivot that's fundamentally re-engineering its national human capital, and, well, with it, its future. That's right. We'll be exploring how this deliberate shift towards an army of engineers impacts China's high-tech ambitions and, perhaps surprisingly, casts a pretty long shadow over the arts and humanities. It's a really compelling case study, I think, not just of national strategy directly influencing individual academic and career paths on you know, a massive scale, yeah. but of a government actively shaping the very fabric of its intellectual landscape. Mm -hmm. We'll move beyond simply outlining what's happening to critically examine the broader implications, mm -hmm. how this shift is being orchestrated with such speed and intent, and maybe what it suggests about different models of higher education in a globally competitive world. That framing gets right to the heart of it, doesn't it? You'll hear how the choices of millions of students, their parents, and, crucially, government officials are all converging to create something remarkably distinct and intensely focused. Mm. What stands out immediately when you look at the evidence isn't just the sheer scale, though that's huge, but the deliberate and almost unparalleled intent behind this monumental realignment. It's not accidental. Not at all. It's by design. And for our exploration today, we're drawing heavily on a recent article from The Economist, which paints a fascinating picture. It certainly does. So, okay, how is this massive pivot actually playing out on the ground? How is it affecting millions of young lives? Well, the article paints this really striking picture of the choices facing China's youth. It highlights a key moment that's actually approaching pretty soon, June 26, 2025. Right, the Gaokao result. Exactly. On that day, some 4.8 million test takers, that's from China's notoriously intense National University Entrance Exam, they'll find out if they've secured a university spot. A life-changing moment for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And for a rapidly growing number of them, the path to what's often described as a glittering future increasingly leads straight into engineering. And that's where the numbers get really interesting, isn't it? The contrast with elsewhere. It's truly fascinating, yes. Yeah. The stark contrast with Western nations really puts the scale into perspective. Mm. So in 2022, which is the latest data we have, a staggering 36% of all Chinese undergraduate entrants chose an engineering degree. 36%. That's about 1.6 million people, right? Yeah, 1.6 million people. And that's a significant jump from 32% back in 2010. Now, compare that to countries like Britain or America. Where it's tiny in comparison. It's tiny. The proportion of undergrads choosing engineering hovers around just 5%. So like you said, this isn't about some sudden organic fascination with engineering principles among Chinese youth. Yeah. It's about a very clear, highly effective governmental push to steer young talent in a specific, strategically vital direction. That scale of redirection, as you said, isn't accidental. But how exactly is Beijing pulling these levers? What's the engine driving this massive state re-engineering of its workforce? Well, the article suggests that China's government is, and this is a quote, strikingly good at guiding young people into these high-tech fields it wants to dominate. Strikingly good. And how do they manage that? Well, when you look at the structural machinery, you start to see why. Universities in China operate under pretty tight state control. Right. Their leaders are civil servants, yeah. effectively. And their funding comes primarily from the state, not really from student fees like in many Western countries. Okay, so that gives them direct control. Exactly. It allows for direct strategic redirection of resources and academic focus in a way that's simply not possible in many other educational systems around the world. It's a powerful tool. And this isn't entirely new, is it? There's a historical precedent. That's a really important point. If we connect this to the bigger picture, it's not entirely unprecedented, but it's certainly a powerful return to historical roots, maybe with a modern high-tech twist. Okay. You see, in the early decades of the People's Republic, the tiny proportion of young people who even made it to university were specifically directed towards highly utilitarian subjects, things like mining, engineering, agriculture. All right, build the nation, feed the people. Exactly. The goal then was to industrialize the nation and feed its population. Now, student choices did widen somewhat in the 2000s as China's private sector flourished, uh -huh. and you saw more students opting for economics or business. But that trend has clearly stalled and, in fact, reversed quite dramatically in recent years. And what forces are driving these individual choices now, pushing them back towards engineering? Is it just the government push? It seems to be a combination. The article points to a powerful mix of that top-down direction and, crucially, bottom-up economic pressure. Ah, the job market. 
Precisely. There is a quote from a teacher at a Beijing school who reports that pupils are now primarily picking engineering because of very real worries about finding a job. And that's not an unfounded fear, is it? Not at all. This is not a trivial concern, especially with youth unemployment hitting 14.9% uh, in May, according to the official government figures. So while there's strategic direction from the top, mm -hmm. there's also this potent economic imperative from students and parents, making engineering seem like the perceived safest and most promising bet for a secure future. So it's less a free choice and more a kind of directed necessity for many. You could definitely see it that way. But the government isn't just, you know, watching this shift happen or gently nudging it along. The article suggests they've actively accelerated it. How? What does that intervention look like? It's quite direct. In 2023, officials began explicitly telling universities to overhaul their degree programs, to realign their offerings, essentially, and focus intensely on strategic industries and these technological bottlenecks that China feels it needs to overcome to achieve its ambitions. So a very hands-on approach, far beyond just guidance. Very hands-on. And this raises a critical question, I think, about the agility and adaptability of an entire educational system. I mean, how quickly can such a massive, complex structure pivot like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, last year, the education ministry announced something truly radical. They called it an emergency mechanism. An emergency mechanism. Yes, specifically designed to create new degrees far more quickly than usual precisely to meet what they term national priorities. Wow. So this isn't just gradual evolution within academia. Not at all. It's rapid, directed, top-down change designed to produce specific skills on a grand scale, almost on demand. And are we seeing the results? Is it actually working? It seems so. We're already seeing the concrete results of this emergency mechanism and the strategic redirection. There's been a flurry of newly specialized engineering degrees cropping up across the country. Like what, for example? Well, artificial intelligence is a big one. Over 600 Chinese universities now offer undergraduate programs in AI. 600. And you see the effects. The founder of DeepSeek, which is a dynamic AI company making significant waves right now, he actually studied AI at Zhejiang University. And many of the firm's engineers trained at elite places like Peking and Tsinghua. So it's not just about quantity, it's also fostering quality and elite training at speed. Exactly, at an astonishing pace. And beyond AI, other new and emerging fields are being prioritized with incredible foresight and um, precision. Such as? Last year, several institutions started offering degrees in low-altitude technologies. Low-altitude? You mean like drones? Think everything from delivery drones to flying cars, potentially. Oh. Officials clearly see this as a significant new source of economic growth for the nation. Interesting. Flying cars. And looking ahead, next year, some places will begin offering degrees in medical device manufacturing. Ah, uh, that sounds strategic. Very strategic. Because for the moment, China currently relies heavily on American companies in that crucial sector. So this highlights a clear, proactive push for self-sufficiency and technological independence across critical industries. It demonstrates a very calculated approach to building out specific capabilities. Okay, so this deliberate and you know supercharged redirection towards engineering and high-tech fields, it naturally has a flip side, doesn't it? It does. And the article rather provocatively calls this the illiberal arts. What does that mean? Well, it refers to those academic fields like the humanities and maybe some social sciences that are now being viewed as less critical to immediate national goals. So while demand for these new engineering courses is undeniably strong, fueled by middle class Chinese parents who, you know, believe that government promotion means future jobs and state funding which is a rational calculation from their perspective. Right. But at the same time, other academic fields are facing significant cuts or even being phased out entirely. Indeed. It's almost a zero-sum game when resources are finite and national priorities are so sharply defined like this. Funding is falling, or in some cases just disappearing entirely, for degrees the government deems less useful or not directly aligned with those immediate national economic goals. Less useful. Yeah. The article notes that some management or economics courses at Chinese universities can even be, well, quite mediocre. Partly because China has only offered them for a relatively short period compared to engineering, and they're often taken less seriously by university administrators. And the humanities? The humanities in particular are explicitly considered more of a soft option. 
that phrasing itself reflects a very specific value judgment from the state on intellectual pursuits. And the impact is real. We're seeing programs cut. Oh, absolutely. The impact on these less useful fields is significant and widespread. Across China, institutions have ended more than 5,000 programs over the past five years. 5,000 programs. That's a massive academic reshaping. It is. For instance, the prestigious Fudan University in Shanghai, a top-tier institution, announced this spring that it was slashing the share of places for humanities students from what used to be maybe 30-40% of their total enrollment mm -hmm. down to just 20%. Wow. And why? Specifically to expand its high-tech programs and create new innovation colleges. Okay. Any other example? Sure. Sichuan University last year stopped offering degrees in things like musicology, insurance, and even television studies. Musicology, insurance, quite a mix. It is. And looking at more foundational subjects, two provinces have stated they will reduce the number of students studying English. Furthermore, several universities have promised to cut even more subjects if a high proportion of graduates holding degrees in those fields can't find employment within a certain time frame. So performance or perceived market value is directly tied to survival now. It seems that way. And this really compels us to ask a crucial question, not just for China, mm -hmm. but maybe for any society, considering such a hyper-focused approach to education. What is the ideal balance between strategic national development, which is understandable, and the broader intellectual enrichment that varied disciplines provide? Right. While the drive for a highly skilled engineering workforce is clear from a national strategy perspective, the article highlights the very real cost to other academic fields, and by extension, the cost to the diversity of thought, critical inquiry, and cultural understanding that they foster. It's a trade-off. A trade-off with potentially profound long-term implications for the shape of society and maybe its capacity for more holistic innovation beyond just the purely technical. So let's bring this together. What does this all mean for China's future? And maybe more broadly for you, the listener, as someone navigating an increasingly complex global landscape. Well, this shift isn't just about numbers or statistics on student enrollment, is it? No, clear as not. It's about a deeply intentional, top-down national strategy to build a high-tech powerhouse. It's about creating this army of engineers, even if it means significantly narrowing academic and career paths for millions of young people. It really compels us to consider those inherent trade-offs in such a highly focused approach, doesn't it? Absolutely. While China aims for technological dominance and increased self-reliance, through this strategy goals, you can understand, we can also ponder what might be lost. Hmm. What might be lost when fields like the humanities, the social sciences, even certain business disciplines are actively sidelined or you know starved of resources. It encourages you as a listener to think about the different models of education and innovation that are at play around the world. Exactly and what each model prioritizes, and perhaps what it might inadvertently sacrifice in the process. This examination really makes you consider that intricate interplay between national priorities, urgent economic pressures, and the individual aspirations or perhaps necessities of millions. It does. And it leaves you with a thought to consider, perhaps. What are the long-term societal implications when a nation so strategically cultivates one type of expertise, potentially at the expense of others? Yeah. What does that mean for fostering broader critical thinking, adaptability, and ultimately societal resilience in the face of challenges you maybe can't foresee right now? A big question and one worth pondering.